All right, thanks, Jonathan. So this is the fourth and final part of our Soil Changing Farmers webinar series. Um, we thank you for those of you who have, who have joined us so far. And uh, for those of you who haven't, we do have all of these recorded on our uh, YouTube channel. So uh, all four parts will be on the uh, YouTube. Um, all three previous ones are already on there and then Dan's will be uploaded probably within the week. So we're grateful to have Dan with us today. He's from uh, South Central Minnesota. So, so far in this webinar series, We've been in California, we've been in Virginia, and then we're getting a little bit closer to home um, here in the Midwest. We had um, Columbus, Nebraska represented last week, and now, uh, like I said, Minnesota today. So we're grateful to have Dan with us. Um, Dan's been um, farming, um, I suppose, your whole life, right, Dan? Yep, that's correct. Uh, I just want to say thank you, Davis, for having me on today. This is uh, glad to talk with you guys and be a part of this webinar. So. Awesome. Well, yeah, we're grateful to have you. And uh, Dan, I'm just going to let you go ahead. I think uh, some of the stuff that I would be explaining, you're going to get to in some of your slides anyway. So without further ado, uh, Dan, go ahead. So I'm um, just going to talk a little bit about our operation starting out. Um, we farm uh, South Central Minnesota, like Davis had mentioned. I farm with my brother and my parents. Um, Family-owned operation started in uh, 1940 with my um, grandpa's uncle actually had owned the operation beginning and kind of transitioning down the line. Uh, my grandfather farmed here and, and my parents and now me and my brother are transitioning to fourth generation. So uh, we milk 110 dairy cows with automatic milking systems. Uh, previously this year, we were actually still milking 220 cows. We've uh, downsized our dairy operation to better equip ourselves to uh, do a little bit better job with soil management around the land we farm. And um, also, just on the next note, so we have 900 steers on confinement, uh, 30 beef cows, which we are experimenting a little bit with rotational grazing. And 4,000 acres of cropland where we have uh, 28 center pivot irrigation systems. So we've been no-tilling for six years and cover crop integration about five. So, do the next slide, sorry. So on our farm, we grow corn and soybeans, cereal rye, oats, alfalfa, and canning peas. Um, yeah, let's go, I suppose, the next slide right away again. I apologize, guys. I thought we were doing Q&A in between, so just getting a little off topic here. Um, but, yeah, I guess a little history of our farm, um, as far as uh, no tillage and cover crop goes, before we had experienced or started with cover crops, our farm was full with tillage, uh, very variable soils in our part of the world. Um, hence the fact we have 28 center pivot irrigation systems. So we were uh, kind of desperate, I guess, a lot of um, terrible crops in our part of the world, just we couldn't maintain yields everything was pretty unsustainable. And my brother had started experimenting or learning about no tillage, which was something I think everybody on our farm was very skeptical about, myself included. Just beginning out, it was something we weren't used to. And yeah, since we've experimented with it, we've kind of elaborated and we're trying to get further down the line as we go, so. And Dan, yeah, I apologize. I didn't mention that. But yeah, if you want to go through your slide share uh, for maybe 20, 30 minutes, however long it takes to explain um, what you're okay. doing. And then we okay. can, uh, I'll have some questions before we open it up for Q&A. Okay. Uh, if we can do next slide, Jonathan, thank you. So um, one thing I'll talk about are beef cows that we have integrated. Um, canning peas is one of our um, early season or warm season crops that we harvest. So that's kind of where we ex started experimenting with full season cover crops. 
and uh, we brought the cows to the field where it's uh, plausible for us. We are kind of surrounded by city on all sides. We're kind of rural, but we're just south of town about seven, eight miles. So um, where we're grazing is very close to our farm, uh, just, just because of fear of, you know, traffic and major highways. So we got a single poly wire will run around these fields and um, yeah, we turned the 30 beef cows loose with their calves. This year wasn't a very good year for us. Not a lot of our fields that were peas were uh, very close to the farm. So we didn't get a lot of warm season grazing this year. Unfortunately, we were just struck to pasture. I do believe that rotational grazing is something I would really love to elaborate on our farm. It's it's definitely shown benefits, not only on yield maps, but uh, from a soil health perspective. We have seen dramatic changes where we can bring those cows out there and cycle those nutrients and uh, kind of stamp those into the ground. So, um, yeah, so with the beef cow integration, uh, cover crop integration, most of our, uh, another point I wanted to bring with our fall was a little bit tougher than normal years as far as moisture. Uh, I was telling Davis the other day that we had, uh, normally we're about 90% planted by this time, going into winter even greater this year, we were about 35% of cover crops planted. So it was a different um, management technique for us. You know, something I wasn't used to, something since we've started using cover crops sort of bothers me because, um, I think our principles have changed a little bit on our farm and the way we look at things, myself especially, uh, I do have pride in having our cover crops planted in a timely manner and keeping the soil covered going into winter. So uh, it's going to bring a different set of management tasks for us this year, but I think um, first and foremost, the fields I don't have planted, I'm going to try and get some manure cover on from our, our confinement feedlots to keep the soil covered going into spring and hopefully uh, prevent some erosion. I'm sure we're going to experience some, but um, hopefully to a minimum, just keep the fields covered the best we can. So if we could do next slide again, Jonathan. Um, another example of a warm season cover crop following peas. Uh, most of our cover crops are about a thousand acres a year is devoted to Diverse cover would be following cereal rye, small grain, or oats, or canning peas. And I do feel that's where we get our greatest benefit to our operation uh, from a nutrient cycling standpoint. And, um, you know, holding wind erosion, uh, water infiltration, and getting, them, getting the most out of our irrigation systems. Uh, next slide, Jonathan. So... Uh, this is something I'm very excited about. Um, some new practices we're trying to implement on our farm. Um, you know, we're, I, sorry if I didn't mention, but our 4,000 acres is spread far and wide. Uh, locally, we have, or centrally located near the farm, we have about 2,500 acres to pretty close. That's That gets manure from our confinement feedlots and the stuff that's further away, we were always spinner spreading our P and K on and kind of using the um, our air seeder to incorporate them when we planted, if you will. But we were kind of noticing that we were getting, um, we were noticing P and K stratification in our soil tests. And we purchased a, a strip till uh, ETS soil warrior that we're implementing on probably about a thousand acres a year. Uh, another thing we're trying to elaborate on or do better on our farm is Haney testing and more intense soil testing so that we can pay closer attention to crop nutrition. Um, starting next year, I'm going to start implementing compost in furrow on our farm. Uh, that's something that is very new to me. So I'm learning as I go, but just a few things there. Uh, tissue sampling and fertigation, breaking yield barriers with reduced inputs. So this year is our first year 
uh, doing fertigation on our farm. We hadn't done it in the past. And that was a very big uh, change for our operation. So one thing, if we could go to the next slide, Jonathan. One thing I will mention, um, going into from a, a full no-till system to integrating strip till was very uh, a very hard topic for me, just because I was, you know, I'm now that we've learned about the benefits of no tillage and bringing strip tillage into our system was something that made me very uncomfortable. Um, my brother was kind of the, the leading way for adding strip till to our farm. These are both examples of a field that had a warm season cover crop on that we did strip till this midsummer. Um, I was, I'm going to be honest, I was very skeptical this spring as well, just, just for the mere fact that we were doing tillage in our fields. Uh, from a crop perspective and uh, crop nutrient management, I do feel like for these farms that are not getting manure and organic materials, I think it's a better, a better all around alternative for um, putting your P and K down. So this field, I was, like I said, I was surprised that it um, looked as good as it did after being strip tilled. So next slide, Jonathan. Um, this was our, so this is the first field my brother had strip till the spring. Um, like I said, I was very skeptical about strip till, uh, from a nutrient standpoint and from a crop perspective, I do feel like we have increased our nutri nutrient uptake on these fields that are utilizing strip tillage without manure, just because we're banding it in the root zone and, you know, this field was a diverse cover last year and strip tilled into this spring. And I was utmostly appalled by the the difference in the crops we were seeing on these farms. Um, the highest level, I believe, of crop production we've ever seen on these fields, as well as um, very nutrient dense crops. I was blown away by that. So. Next slide, Jonathan. Um, this was, so this was kind of our experiment, um, downsizing our herd. Me and my brother had a discussion this year about, well, how are we gonna replace the revenue that our farm has created with having dairy cattle? Obviously milk prices weren't very good this year, so it wasn't very hard to uh, upsell what we were trying to do, but my brother uh, and I had a discussion if we could increase crop fertility, increase um, crop density. And, um, you know, our goal was five bushels on corn. I think we will surpass that this year. But um, this was just one trial. I had experimented with it on our canning peas. So uh, we no-tilled our canning peas, which our, who, the grower we grow them for was not, um, too pleased by the idea of no tilling peas. And it was a very hard sell for him. So it was, um, once we did it, I was pretty, pretty skeptical myself just because we had worked if they were at least minimum of vertical tillage the last few seasons. And I got them on board to let me do every acre this year, which is about 300 acres of canning peas. And the further away field, um, I did nothing to. We put our P and K down like we normally do, and that was that. This field um, has a history of manure, and we, or I, I should say, we um, did a foliar trial on it. And the difference that was noted to me was we had 125 less pounds of product raised on this field. But because of the product's quality, we were given $132 an acre more gross pay. Uh, by the time it was all said and done, I do believe with the foliar application, we were somewhere close to $90 to $100 an acre and um, increased profits on that field. And not only that, it was a higher quality. It made grade A canning, which is something that we haven't done in the 10 years of growing peas. So that was very eye-opening for me, just something simple that didn't take a whole lot of effort. I mean, just the right timing and putting the right products down do seem to make a difference. 
Next slide, Jonathan. Um, so this is part of the uh, our next year's trials on our farm. Uh, I've made four Johnson Sioux bioreactors on our farm to implement in furrow next spring. Both corn and soybeans, I do believe, will implement it on. And I've been um, doing quite a bit of research on farm-made biofertilizers, if we could produce and make some of our own um, foliar applications, in furrow applications, if it would be viable options for um, saving revenue and also, um, or saving cost, I'm sorry, and increasing crop nutrition, crop fertility. But what I do like about it is uh, we're going to hopefully eventually reduce and limit our usage on uh, synthetic fertilizers, chemical fertilizers. I don't think we'll ever get away from them 100%, but I do think these are good alternatives to reductions. So next slide, Jonathan. Um, this is my last slide. So whether you think you can or you can't, you're right, Henry Ford. Uh, I think that's a very wonderful quote. Um, we, you know, there's a lot of times where I felt like we were doing the wrong things or we, uh, we don't have it right, but it's very rewarding when um, we start to see our, our crops flourish and, you know, our nutrient density does seem to be increasing um, quite regularly with our no tillage and covered crops. So, yeah. Awesome. Uh, before we get into some questions, I love the pictures that you've chosen here. Uh, would you mind uh, just explaining real quick on each of those? Yep. So uh, we've experimented quite a bit with interseeding. I did it uh, two previous seasons. Uh, uh, we started, actually, we did a 60-inch corn plot at home under 25 acres of irrigation. And I really like the benefits we saw from a soil health perspective. Obviously, from a, a revenue perspective, we didn't do quite as well. And we have enough warm season to raise off that. I don't know that we could get the full benefit of interseeding. Uh, but one portion about interseeding that I do like is you're, you're keeping the ground covered on every square inch. There's no gaps in between our 30-inch rows. And let's see the other ones. So most of it is on interseeding our, our beef cattle grazing. Like I said, was more experimental on our farm. I would like to elaborate on that or uh, expand on that. I'm sorry, in the future. It's, I, I do believe it's one of the better things we can do for our no tillage systems, but it just, it requires a level of management. And I think a higher staff than we have on our farm. I'd love to do more of it, but it's just a, from a time perspective, how do you get it all done? And, you know, I I hope to someday have the infrastructure and build build perimeter fences and do more of it, but currently that's where we're at, so. Very if nice. I didn't mention, we, oh, go ahead, Davis. Oh yeah, well, I was just going to, uh, there's all, all sorts of follow-up questions that I wanna get to. Um, but I wanted to uh, just kind of summarize maybe a little bit of what I'm hearing about as we think about the soil health principles and some of the stuff that you shared. Uh, so reduced disturbance, you've talked about no-till um, and strip-till. Um, so uh, as opposed to a lot of the uh, tillage practices, I mean, uh, I used to have a grandma that live in, uh, lived in Minnesota. It's pretty common to drive through the state and see a lot of black fields, uh, which great because you've got really rich soils, uh, but a lot of yep. bare soils. And so um, you're keeping the ground so much more covered. Um, you're armoring that. You're keeping living roots in the soil as much as possible uh, and doing it in uh, with diversity as much as possible. I like how you have those cool season uh, cash crops, and that's allowing you to really position yourself well for these warm season cover crops and really diverse cover crops and then utilizing that with the livestock uh, with the livestock integration 
Um, so uh, I just, uh, I'm just thinking through all those boxes and how you're uh, checking all of those. And uh, I really compliment you because it seems like in such a short amount of time, I, I don't know if it feels like a long amount of time or a short amount of time since you got started with this uh, no-till six years ago, cover crops five years ago. Uh, but it just seems like you've uh, really gone in on all of it and uh, have uh, implemented all of those soil health practices. And I will, you know, my brother was a big driver for us going to no-tillage. And I, for one, it's just, you know, my family's practices were always tillage. And it was very... very uh, odd for me starting out and once I started learning about the benefits and you know the worlds we've seen in the past with dust bowls and you know even today they still exist and those sort of things like after you've learned about well I can do something about how I farm and um, you know now I sort of feel a sense of like almost like uh, I have to keep the soil covered because that's my responsibility to not only care for the land, but the people that surround it. I mean, that's our job as farmers. And I, I hold that very near and dear now, just because I, I don't want to be the reason that somebody doesn't go home to their family at night because I, you know, and I don't think that we have to, to farm with the mentality necessarily that, um, you know, if I don't plant a cover crop, somebody's going to die. But I do, I do think that, we're responsible to care for the land and the people that surround it. So what sure. we can do to prevent anything was, you know, that's how I feel about cover crops and, you know, where we are today. So. Yeah. Uh, Dan, can you tell us, uh, you mentioned the various crops that you grow. Uh, would you care to mention the order or how you've built the rotation? This follows this for, um, yeah. Um, so generally we, there's it it all depends on harvest intervals for like so when we plant our cereal rye for instance um you know it all depends like when we chop corn silage in the fall you know if we get acres off early we always try to get our small grain because you know statistically speaking cereal rye does better when it can get more tillering in the fall mm -hmm. for grain production so following corn silage and um Younger maturity soybeans, we like to get our cereal rye planted. And canning peas, it's kind of just wherever we have whatever's available for the following season. Generally, um, I like to plant them into soybeans, but sometimes our rotations don't fall that way because canning peas have to be planted every fourth year. So okay. generally, my, my rule of thumb is corn, soybeans, rye, uh, canning peas under irrigation otherwise on dry land we like to go corn soybeans small grain okay and you mentioned some crops you're no-tilling and some you are strip tilling how'd you decide which ones um, you needed to do some strip till and which ones uh, were conducive to no-till uh so really so this summer I was actually driving around some of our further away farms that we had pulled small grains on I was pulling soil samples and it dawned on me like we our production seems like it's gone down on those farms the last few years but I believe our management has become more intensified um, just because we realized that you know tillage wasn't really or I shouldn't say that we realized that tillage was more of our um, the time we spent tilling we now spend to crop management crop fertility and some of those things that I've noticed is that our production has um, kind of hit a plateau, really, where we were um, just doing no tillage. And, you know, they like to say the or you hear a lot of uh, regenerative agriculture experts talk about um, stratification wouldn't exist with farm season cover crops. I do believe that when you have, you know, you get to the southern states, like, and um, southern states where it doesn't freeze quite as early as it does here, you get good cover crop growth every year. Um, here, if I get a cover crop planted November 1st, I'm lucky if it's a inch tall in the spring. Mm -hmm. So I feel like on those farms that has costed us just because we, uh, we're not getting that root growth down to get nutrient cycling in the fall. 
So on those farms that we can't get planted early enough or we don't have manure, you know, year after year, we do small feedings of manure. Uh, so we're not disturbing um, fungus and bacteria too aggressively and microbes. So we like to keep the, the manure to a lighter rate. And, you know, with the fertility, we don't really have that benefit just because we don't have the time with um, the further away stuff. So the strip tilling was kind of brought for those further away fields that, Either we don't have organic materials to for cycling nutrients, so we kind of are making it more of a practice on the further away stuff. So, okay, yeah. Uh, had a question about um about the cattle. You mentioned you're grazing yearlings. Uh, what weights are you bringing them in on the grazing cover crops, and what uh, weight are you transitioning them to the feedlot? So um, most of our grazing is actually just a cow calf pair. Okay. That we're doing. So we have our. Uh, are you talking about um, our finished or just our feedlot cattle? Um, maybe the different classes of livestock or classes of cattle that you've got. I think one of the one of those last pictures looked to be yearlings. Um, but I may have okay. Seen. Those are so those were actually our three year old beef cows at the time. Okay. Um. But yeah, we graze we graze them with their calves throughout the summer on cover crops. I like I really want to get to rotational grazing status, but um, currently we will pull out. Uh, we just have whatever it's an eighty of warm season cover crops, and we'll try and split it in two or three paddocks, dependent on water sources and water availability. Okay, um, like I said, we have been set up strategic. Um, strategic strategic infrastructure yet so sure okay and then i've got one other question before i uh, get to some of these uh, questions that are building um from the attendee uh, question list um i was curious about that uh that test that you did on the canning peas i thought that was an excellent test and i loved uh the different uh, the different inputs that you had there and what you were comparing that to. I love that you talked about not only the yield differences, but the profitability differences, which if you looked at only one of those, you would have probably a different conclusion than right. both of those. Um, in that slide, it said that you had a reduction of yield by doing uh, maybe this more regenerative model with it, yeah. uh, but you had increased profitability. What do you think it would take to also have boosted uh, yield along with the more profitable um, or, or less costly inputs maybe. See, that's what I don't understand is like we, um, you know, with with our, the further away field we're receiving um, synthetic fertilizer and this one is receiving manure. Um, they've both been in the same rotation for peas. So every four years they're both in peas. I have, like I said, never raised grade A canning peas in 10 seasons. And we did some soil sampling um, that spring right before we put the crop in. And just kind of looking at, like, obviously peas, or for whatever reason, peas love boron. I'm not super intelligent with crop fertility, but I'm starting to experiment with these things and hopefully learn along the way. But um, it, I like I say, I think I was right around $25 an acre by the time I was done with this foliar application and it was one pass hmm. i feel like if you'd take another step or i mean, you know there's only so much time in the day people say but you know if you could go out at night when you get done with work and you get one more pass on or one more field done it's just how much further you could take things to the next level sure so okay well, as we get into our attendee questions, one of the first questions is about peas. Um, uh, we here in Nebraska don't have uh, much peas grown, um, and I'm not sure where this attendee is from, but um, interesting uh, just to have that as a crop option. Um, is that a local place that you're able to take those, and how long have you been raising peas? So we've been raising peas for 10 years. They're cannery peas. Um the growers we grow for is actually uh, Seneca. They do a lot of processing for green giant. So that was kind of the other thing that led me to think that what can we do better is this stuff does go to food production. So, you know, every time I till it, every time I spray it, I'm potentially, you know, 
increasing the odds and I'm not a organic grower, but I just, I like to think that if I can do it better, I'm going to try. So. Mm -hmm. Very nice. And do you figure any, um, do you have a nitrogen credit number in mind as you go to the next crop? So it's very um, difficult because you think the peas are, you know, the straight legume. So obviously they're pumping quite a bit of nitrogen into the system. And we kind of try to offset it with our warm season cover crop. Um, I've taken some handy tests following canning peas. And anywhere from 80 to 120 pounds of nitrogen is what we see following peas. So there's quite a bit of credit there. But okay. um, we've done some reductions in fertilizer following peas too, just through testing. But another thing I haven't quite got down to the boards yet is CNN ratios. And... Mm getting our you know getting the right nutrients to make those things available so we we did some cut rate and but um it did cost me a little bit of yield penalties i think um but i think part of it is is just getting the, the fertility set in check so and getting nutrients there that need to be there okay and then um, maybe similarly with that nitrogen credit, uh, did you mention alfalfa in the rotation as well? I did, yep. Okay, and so how long is that um, productive? And then uh, you transition that to something else. And um, how do you make that transition? And what does that mean as far as uh, nitrogen reduction? So we, um, in the past, we would keep an alfalfa stand as long as possible. You know, you spend a lot of money on seed. So we'd have alfalfa in production for six, seven years. And one thing I um, noticed last year uh, coming out of alfalfa, the seven year stand, our pH is way out of whack. Um, you know, you're pouring the coals and synthetic fertilizer because you're harvesting all the nutrients off the field. Sure. And my, what's telling me is we need to rotate alfalfa more often. And, um, you know, our, our lime gets out of whack, our pH or our pH gets out of whack and our NPK levels are, you know, we get plenty of N from alfalfa, but it's just, I think we kind of burn the soil out with keeping alfalfa in that long. So right. our new game is three years alfalfa. And um, I'm trying to kind of switch away from the Roundup Ready alfalfa just for the, the mirror. I have done some testing on our farm. Um, Roundup Ready alfalfa is we're not quite getting the same amount of nutrient levels or um, our feed samples are showing that um, we're not getting quite the feed quality that we would expect Interesting from high dollar alfalfa compared to non-GMO alfalfa. So right. I figured by a cheaper alfalfa rotated out more often and that gives us the option to, to um, you know, not harvest so many nutrients off the field. So sure. Okay. Um, since you brought up the uh, Roundup Ready alfalfa and um, and going away from that a little bit, um, it does does looking at organic fit into this, especially with a food grade crop like peas? Um, do you have more marketing potential to consider something like that, or do you like what you've found uh, with the uh, without having to do that? Yeah, you know, I I I take my hats off to people that do organic. It's you know they're they're doing awesome work. Um, just for us, um, obviously the marketing is a little bit further away. I mean, peas, we could do organic, but I know I have a neighbor very close by that does organic, uh, large scale, uh, full width tillage, and he's hauling a lot of it to Iowa, North Dakota. And, hmm. you know, I'm, I, I don't like sitting in the truck that long. I get pretty impatient. And, yep. Um, yep. But yeah, I do. I do think there's something to be said about um, crop nutrition and GMOs versus non-GMOs. Something I didn't think much about five, six years ago, but I'm starting to see it just on our farm. That still uses um, we still use Roundup and um, some pre pre-emerge herbicides, and I'm starting to notice on our long-term no-tillage systems that we're starting to see, um, like you say, higher forage qualities and heavier test weight corn soybeans so you know any any um opportunity to go organic i'd love to i just i see rick clark's method and i i think it's amazing but i'm not at that level 
yeah really? i hope hope one day but not there yeah well context is everything and you mentioned even the proximity to the a place that could take organic versus where you can take yours now um and personally not wanting to spend that much time trucking and so uh yeah i, I think it I think it speaks well that you've uh, that you consider so many different parts of your context and how these things fit together. Uh, I also wanted to go back. Uh, you mentioned uh, kind of burning up um, or, or carbon to nitrogen ratios, uh, and that's another thing that I noticed from your uh, your crop rotation as well is you have more grasses than legumes and uh, maybe. Uh, maybe by a margin of like, uh, what, five to two or something like that. Um, not exactly sure, but it seems like you're, you're conscious of pushing the carbon just as much as you do with a um, leguminous crop. Yep. So, and that's another thing too, like our further away stuff. Um, I'm trying to be very conscious always, you know, you want to be, I think around 40 pounds, of, our mixes, we always develop around 40 pounds of grass. Um, two to about two, two and a half pounds or less of brassicas and um, three to five pounds of broad leaves and then uh, legumes. Uh, generally, the further away stuff, I'd like to flip flop that a little bit just because I'm not getting the, the nitrogen credits without the manure and the livestock. So um, closer to home, I'll probably be like, two pounds of legumes farther away from home as high as 20. So it just depended on where we're, where we are and what we're following. So. Sure. Okay. Do you have any favorite cover crop species uh, maybe in terms of what you notice the cattle grazing and are they really hitting any certain species hard or for soil building? Have you noticed anything? Um, and those might be one and the same. So like one of the first cover crops we ever did in a warm season mix was millet. Japanese millet and I've always been crazy about it since because the first year we grazed it the cattle went crazy over it it was just getting to boot stage when we put them out there and um, I noticed like throughout that mix there was plenty of things available the first thing the cows went to was the millet I hmm. I don't know why it was in that particular instance but it was sort of a light bulb opener for me too because I have never been much about um pheasant hunting or anything like that and since we started growing warm season cover crops it's like millet the pheasants love millet and it's so cool like that's my opportunity to go out and evaluate uh our warm season cover crops as i walk i walk the the pea fields the rye fields and pheasant hunt and most of the time i don't care if i necessarily harvest birds i just have fun being out there in, in the field and looking looking at what, what the cover crop did and how it's servicing the field and the ops. Yeah, I can tell you spend a fair amount of time doing that. And really, I think that's one of the most important things we can do in agriculture is just taking time to go walk the fields, actually get in close to it and observe. And really in the theme of soil changing farmers, you can't, you can't really change the soil or at least be aware of how you're doing it. Uh, without that power of observation. So um, again, just uh, crucial, I think, uh, within this regenerative journey. That's, um, you know, that one thing I mentioned is noticing things that we never noticed before. And, you know, my, my son was born, we came home from the hospital, that's something I'll never forget. We had warm season, cover crop pollen peas behind the farm. And I heard Ray Archuleta once say, um, you know, you can, when you know you develop the right mix, you can hear it, you can see it. Hmm. And I just thought that was so cool because um, me and my wife came home, my son was crying. I couldn't get him to stop crying. And I told her, I was like, I'm just going to take him for a walk. And we walked down into the cover crop field and, you know, um, I'm sure she would have been terrified if she had come with because the, <laughs> the bees were crazy. The sunflowers were full bloom. It was the end of August. And that's just some. Some that was the day I realized like there's more to this than just the cover crop. Like you, you know, I've never like when Ray said that when you can, when there's when you have the abundance of bees in the field, you can actually feel them kind of buzzing around you, mm. and that that was just insane to me. The amount of uh, pollinators in the field, and you know, 
that year we had harvest harvested a, about a dozen birds off of that 40 acre field of pheasants uh, i took a couple of my friends out there and we just had a blast and um it was one of those things or observation like there was no real wildlife habitat around this field at all and all of a sudden there's a hundred birds in a 40 acre field i just couldn't believe it you know we right. bring the cover crop to the field and they come it's just it's... right that's beautiful yeah i mean that brings it all full picture when you're getting into not just um agronomics but uh, i mean there, there's a lot a lot of um beauty to what you just shared there with um the family aspect the community aspect um and yeah just observing and enjoying what you have there yep so awesome. well cool uh, i've got a couple more questions here in the um in the uh, from attendee questions uh chuck from nevada is bringing up the compost uh that you said that that's something that you're getting into more and so his question is, can you elaborate more on your setup for the Johnson Sioux? Um, and if you're going to be doing a liquid application or if you're going to be doing a, a finished compost, um, a, a dry compost. So anything on that? And if you're too early uh, with that um, at this point, uh, even just sharing a little bit about where you're learning this, maybe. Uh, can you still hear me? I apologize. I don't know why my video went away. But... No problem. Um, yeah, we can. We can still hear you just fine. Okay. Um, yeah, so our setup is kind of simple. We actually had um, our other side of our dairy barn that we were milking in had uh, a milking area for spots. And I kind of converted that into, because it, it has in-floor heat and it's warm. And that's kind of the whole goal with compost is keep it above freezing. So um, I follow a lot of um, Jay Young's method. I think what he's doing is pretty cool stuff and um, using IBC containers to make my Jonathan Sioux compost. My plan is to um, harvest this stuff and make it into liquid. So it'll be foliar applications or in applications, but it's just starting out. I've made um, four bioreactors and we're going to uh, run with it. Maybe some seed coatings. But I plan to do it all in liquid form. I haven't made any sort of extractor yet. I'm, I've done a lot of research, hours and hours of research on um, making an extractor. I, I do think there's some pretty awesome products out there that are manufactured. It's just uh, entry level for me. So I don't know if I'm going to spend the kind of money that um, these uh, manufactured ones are. I've seen some pretty cool stuff that guys are making just on their own farms utilizing um old fertilizer tanks or water tanks with pumps and yeah there's a whole nother level but it's the the filtration stuff is something another thing i gotta learn about to incorporate an in furrow and through a sprayer um i did some jadam liquid fertilizer mixing stuff um radishes alfalfa sort of um i don't know if you will bruise extracts um that basically uh, brew in a barrel and then you harvest them and um, I did some experiments with that trials and putting them you know testing them on live plants so I don't burn or damage crops because I've heard this stuff's pretty concentrated uh, I've seen it firsthand I did a couple fields that I thought was light enough um, and it happened to burn some corn leaves so I'm and that's the other part of me is, is like, there's got to be something more to it. So I think, uh, yeah, unfortunately, my first experience with Jadam liquid fertilizer and in, in uh, foliar application, I mixed it with some algae um, in soil and some micronutrients, EMB, some sugar and brought it out to the field. And I, we got 120 foot booms on our sprayer and I plugged every tip all the way across. So um it makes you, you know, I wasn't necessarily happy about it, but now I just get to go back to the drawing board and try again. So sure, sure. And where have you been learning most of that uh, for? I've got a lot of uh, questions myself about um, learning that. Um, what have been the helpful resources for you? And as you uh, go back um, to the drawing board, where are you going? Facebook University has been pretty good to me. All right. Uh, <laughs> so, um, 
Farm Made Biofertz is a very wonderful page. A lot of people that are very intelligent there. Um, much smarter than myself, but it's it's very cool to go to those places and get resources. I mean, hmm. you can ask a question and you you don't feel silly for asking a question that might be stupid to some people, but it's just, you know, there and um, Johnson Sioux Composting, another page that I follow. Um, that's where I learned about Jay Young, and now I actually watch quite a bit of his YouTube, Young Red Angus. It's very cool stuff. So, yeah. And then with with the push into more of this uh, farm made uh, biologicals and um, compost, uh, will you be? You mentioned also that you're going to be getting into more precise or more frequent soil testing and plant testing how is how is this going to change maybe your testing and then therefore hopefully uh the the fertilizer program so um one thing i will say is I, i'm still learning about uh the haney test very unfamiliar to me i grew up with the the simple bray olson tests and um i've done a fair amount of haney sampling on our farm I'm still not 100% rehearsed on um, how to read them yet. I'm still getting there. I've had some guidance, other people that have stepped up and um, sort of led me a, the right way and try to get me pointed in the right direction. But any opportunity that I have to sit in on um, something at the National No-Tillage Conference this year to learn more about Haney testing, I, I am very um, excited about the technologies they have offered with that, just because um, the CO2 burst and your carbon to nitrogen ratios, I, I found out yesterday that uh, magnesium and calcium are very big proponent to getting conversions in your nitrogen. And that's something I did not know. So just, yeah, any way I can in the future utilize these to re reduce inputs and yeah, Jay Young's utilizing it uh, to reduce, actually, from my understanding, he's not using any 1034-0 in furrow, or maybe he still has some, but a large majority of his testing has suggested that Johnson Sioux Compost would replace 1034-0, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah. Are you doing your own uh, prescriptions and fertility plans, or are you working with an agronomist for that? So uh, my brother does a large majority of our fertility prescriptions. Him and I will sit down and do um, our nitrogen applications. We do uh, urea. We would like to do liquid nitrogen. Uh, just one of the other things we have a sprayer and we do our own crop foliar applications and herbicide applications. So it's very difficult for us to make time for all of it. So we do have urea spread on. Um, at B5 on our corn. So him and I do most of those prescriptions. As far as NP or as P and K goes, he does all of that for the soil warrior. He does when I pull him and I will go out together go our own ways. We each pull samples and um he does all the uh, like I say the strip tilling and I do the cover crop planting in the fall. So okay. Uh, by the way, our last question currently uh, has to do with uh, plant nutrition. There was a picture that you shared, a strip-tilled cornfield that had some green streaks um, in it. Uh, one attendee is pointing out. Any thoughts on that? I think it would be a different picture than this. That looks like the Japanese millet. The cornfield? Yeah. Yeah. I think Jonathan was just on it. I think it's one slide back. Other way. I don't know why. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, this was when the field was maturing. I don't know what I can say about that. Um, that field is, like I said, one of our strip-tilled fields. I I can't tell you why there's green streaking there. I think it was just at the maturing time. Um, I do notice that now that he mentions that it, it's kind of in a couple different spots, but no, I I think I I misread that. Um, yeah, it was probably that cover crop picture and uh, some of the green streaks there. Oh, very good. Yeah, no, my apologies. I wonder if that's perhaps just a matter of some of that Japanese millet looks to be headed out. Some is maybe not. Yeah, um, it's maturing. Um, the other thing was is it was uh, very dry here this summer. I think we received uh, maybe five inches of rain throughout the growing season. And wow. most of it came later. So 
Uh, a lot of this was very drought stricken. Uh, this field in specific, um, normally we don't have to irrigate cover crops, but uh, I did put about two and a half inches on this field just to keep it through small rain events and keep it going because um, you got the investment in a cover crop and it's not doing anything for you when it's sitting there dormancy. So, sure. Yeah. Well, Dan, I think that's all of our questions. So, um, is there anything else that you'd like to share before we wrap things up? You know, um, I would like to say, like, our our journey for no tillage, the transition from tillage uh, was very abrupt. And I think it's just because we farm a lot of variable soils and the response we've seen almost immediately, especially on light soils where we were, um, for whatever reason, we saw a substantial change, um, not only in the soils uh, properties, but the way it looked um the amount of washouts we used to have to fill because we farmed some pretty hilly stuff as well so the that change was abrupt but i think uh i wouldn't have it any other way we've um we've come a long way in six years but we've got a lot further to go so uh one thing i will say is we need to learn a little bit more about um or i shouldn't say learn but be more cautious of rain events uh, in the spring, uh, the last two seasons, we've gotten burnt pretty bad from uh, drought. So our cover crops, unfortunately, have took a lot of the, the moisture that we needed to get the crops started. So, and I know a lot of people say, we'll go out and spray early, but then you're on the other side of things. If you spray early and you get a lot of moisture and you have yep. nothing green holding the hills in, then we all of a sudden we've got washouts. So it's kind of a double-edged sword, but we're we're trying to find... I don't know if you will, but make some finite adjustments to do a better job with that. So, sure. Well, I'm super impressed with everything that you've implemented in, uh, yeah, a relatively short amount of time. Uh, and this finishing slide really encapsulates that well. Uh, just some beautiful pictures. And I love, uh, again, not only what it's done for the crops and the soil, but what it's done for you, your family, your friends as well. So, uh, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, one thing I would love to add, Davis, is this, everything we've accomplished here was not done by me. Um, I, I've i certainly contributed, but um, there's a lot of other people in our operation, family, friends that help us out that have made this all possible. I mean, we couldn't make this transition without all of those people that give us a hand in the summer when they're bored on the weekend and want to come drive a tractor to help make hay or do something else so I can go, you know, start another pivot or make another crop application because those those sort of things are, are what make these cover crops possible. Because if I was, you know, strictly focused on harvesting all the time, I wouldn't be able to make these sort of adjustments to our farm. So. Sure. Absolutely. Well, we really appreciate you being on again. Um, Dan's been extra busy, uh, not only wrapping up the farming year, but he and his wife are about to have a family. So uh, thoughts and prayers with them as they um, add another one to their family. And um, yeah, just a special thanks for um, for his time today. And thanks you, uh, all of you attendees for making time for this as well. Again, um, this will be uploaded on YouTube too, if you want to share it uh, for anybody who wasn't able to join today. Well, thank you guys and take care. Have a Merry Christmas. So good chatting with you, Davis. So thanks, Dan. You too. Yeah. Merry thanks, Jonathan. Appreciate it.